go about and read the whole thing. Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And, when, and I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so we're beginning to uh, enter this sixth angel sounding um, uh, moment, which follows up with a little bit of a pause here, another little picture of what's being seen by the Apostle John. And so if you were to look back in chapter 9 and verse 12, it says, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And I dealt with this a couple weeks ago, but that fifth angel sounds, and we begin to see that torment arrive as scorpions with stings in their tails is what the torment comes from. These locusts that come out of the earth and they begin to strike men, but not the men that were marked with the mark of God. And so that's the first woe. The next, the sixth angel sounds. And when that happens, these four angels are loose and they're prepared for a certain time. And it's at this time when these great woes come upon people that we realize the depravity of men, where though there is a third part being killed, though there is that perpetual torment where before they could not die as a result of the stings, though they wanted them to be so, these men still continue to not repent of worshiping devils, not repent of worshiping idols, gold, silver, stone, and wood, not repent of their murderers, their sorceries, and their fornications, and their theft, but rather they, they stick to their guns and they continue in their rebellion against the living God as he is, he is pleading with them with these last and final plagues that he's pouring out on the earth. And so at this time, John gets to this little segue here. You're not going to find that the second woe is past until Revelation 11 and verse 14. It says the second woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And so in this gap, we have that sixth angel sounding the preparation made by these angels who are about to, to, to pour out their destruction. And then in chapter 10, we see this mighty angel, okay? And he's recorded as another mighty angel. And so that gives me a clue that he hasn't been mentioned before. He hasn't been involved in the scenario yet. So this other angel comes down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So this is interesting because if you keep your finger there in chapter 10, you can go to Revelation chapter 1, where you'll find Jesus described in verse 12, and it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, that's verse 13, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. 
His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, and they burned as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And back in chapter 10, you'll find the description is one that is clothed with a cloud, a rainbow upon his head, his face as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now this isn't an exact description of what we saw in chapter 1. The reasoning for that is because it's not the same person. The one was Jesus Christ, the one was the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the one was the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. The one when he was seen of the Apostle John, he literally hit the ground for fear of the, of the person standing before him, of the Lord standing before him. This one, though, does have character traits that are reminiscent of the Lord. It's interesting. You see that he's a, a mighty angel. See, he, he's clothed with a cloud. And we know that Jesus, in that first chapter, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And so this one is also clothed with a cloud. It describes his fire as it were the sun, or his face as it were the sun, and pillars of fire were what his feet represented. Now, Jesus, it says his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet were like fine brass as if it were on fire. But there's a similarity, though there is also a difference here being made. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 4, when the, when the apostles stood up and they preached publicly in the synagogues, the, the, the men that saw them, the Pharisees by and large, reported and took note of these, it was said. They, they, they took knowledge of them that they were unlearned and ignorant men. When they saw the boldness, they, they knew that they had been with the Lord. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And so what happened was these men were fishermen. They were, they were unlearned. They were perceived as ignorant, especially in spiritual things. And yet they stood up with boldness and proclaimed the word of God. And that gave the onlookers a sign that, hey, these had been with Jesus. These unlearned and ignorant men. I'm taking knowledge of them that they had been with the Lord. And I think that's the exact same thing that you're seeing with this other mighty angel. Is that he is standing with similarities to the Lord. Why? Because we can take knowledge that he had been with the Lord. And went to God, we would have that same uh, sign of us that that people would look at us and they would say hey these have been with Jesus this has been with Jesus there is something in their boldness there's something in their visage there's something that I see on them yeah you know, we don't have rainbows upon our head or or a face as it were the sun though we've seen that manifested in the Old Testament when Moses came and they could not steadfastly look upon his face because it glowed so much because he had been in the presence of God and yet you still see that there are different similarities to the Savior, to this angel. And I believe that we should have that same thing. People should take knowledge of us that we have been in the presence of God. And it does show. When you're in prayer, when you're in your Bible, when you're spending time with God each and every day, people notice. People take note. There is something different about the person that spends time with the Savior than just somebody else in off the street. Somebody who has spent time with the Lord will have that rainbow on their head. Will have that face as it were of the sun. Will walk with feet as they were pillars of fire. It will look and be clear that they have been with the Savior. We too need to understand that we have the same access to the throne that this angel had, though it's by faith. So this angel comes down from heaven having been in the presence of God and shows resemblance to the Lord that he's been spending time with. When we go into our prayer closet, when we spend time in our study and we're reading with the Lord, we have access to the throne of grace. We can step boldly into the throne of grace and have that same experience with the Father where his visage comes upon us. Why? Because, because we have spent time with him. We ought to desire to have that. So regarding this angel in particular, we find, and you can keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 10. Go to Genesis chapter 9. There's an interesting thing of note that is upon him. 
Yeah, we saw he's a mighty angel. He's clothed with a cloud, a face as it were the sun, and these pillars of fire feet. But what's the other one that I want to grab attention to is interesting is that bow, that rainbow that is upon his head. In Genesis chapter 9 and in verse 18, the Bible says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And verse 11, And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall any more, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass. When I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the token of the covenant is clear. In verse 12 it says, There is a bow, verse 13, sorry, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of the covenant. What is the promise of that token? The bow is there to remind God and to be a token between God and man and every living thing that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And yet here we are over in Revelation chapter um, 10, and now there is coming a time where God again is going to destroy all the world. And it's interesting because when that angel comes down out of the cloud, that rainbow is upon his head. It's, it's that token transcending time perpetually as he promised, giving the reminder between God and men that he would never again destroy it with a flood. This doesn't mean he won't destroy it in other manners, because one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. One day all of the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. There is a particular reason why this angel is coming down to stand on the earth and to stand on the water and to proclaim what he proclaims, and it is destruction for the inhabitants of the world. And yet that token transcended time and now he finds it with him that covenant that was in the cloud is now on his head and it's interesting to note that because that's another example and so many times you can do this in the scripture take something from revelation which is the accumulation of time and take something from genesis which is the beginning of all things and you'll find that they yoke up really well together and they actually complement one another because if you just read chapter 10 you would say what is this rainbow? What does it mean? Where is it from? Well, it's clear that that rainbow is that same rainbow that transcends time and goes all the way back to Genesis when God first made that covenant. It's just showing you by indication of that sign and of that token that God is going to destroy, but he will not destroy in the same way that he did before because he promised it to be so. So that covenant, again, is now upon his head. He has remembrance of it. It's, it's the sign as like a front lip between his eyes, giving indication that he's not going to do the judgment the same way that he had before. The interesting thing you see here then in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 10 is now he is going to show where his dominion lies. So he's been restricted by the mark on his head, which is that rainbow that shows that he won't destroy it by the flood. And yet still he is showing that he has dominions over the flood all the same. Read verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open. We'll get there. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And so that stronger right foot is placed in the sea. The left foot is placed upon the earth. 
He is indicating that he has dominion over both of them. Why do I say that? Because standing upon something shows your dominion over something. You can go, if you would, keep your finger there, to Joshua chapter 10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua chapter 10. And one example in the ministry of Joshua is that he was given dominion over every place that the sole of his foot lied. And that just came to me, I just realized now it's a good example of the same. As that angel stands on the sea and on the earth, he's showing his dominion over the same. And Joshua, when he marched into the promised land, God promised that every place that the sole of his foot lied down would be their dominion. It would be their property. And so they were to march through the whole land and just simply reclaim what was theirs. So another example near the middle of that is Joshua chapter 10 and verse 15. The Bible says, And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp of Gilgal. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave, and set men by it for to keep them. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies, and smite the hindermost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities, for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand. So here we have a scenario where these kings come against Joshua. The sun stands still. The battle is, is, is able to be prolonged so that they can have this great victory. The kings that were against them fled themselves into the cave. Joshua takes control of the situation by blocking them into the caves with great stones and then uses that as another opportunity to send the men out to just get more dominion by slaying even the hindermost parts of those that the kings were leaning over. In verse 20 it says, And it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they were consumed, that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. And all the people returned to the camp of Joshua and Makeda in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then said Joshua, watch this, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. So Joshua is very much in control of the situation right here. They were blocked in. They, they tried to hide away from him. He locked them in. He went and slayed the rest of the nations that were under them. And then he says, okay, open the cave now and bring them unto me. Joshua is exhibiting his dominion over these men. He's taken their nation. Now he's taking them out from their hiding place and bringing them unto himself. Verse 23 says, And they did so, and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with them. And this is interesting. So he's in control of the situation and yet he does this as a show of what we we're just talking about. His dominion and his authority over the scenario. What happens is it says come near put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. So that's interesting because you would think that they're in complete control of this scenario. There's no problems here. There's no risk of these unarmed kings rising up against them. The dominion is proven. And yet, as a show of it openly before all, he plays out this scenario where he puts them down and has his men put their feet comfortably on their necks. Verse 25, And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of a good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies at whom against you fight. What is he showing here? He's like, this is a picture of every enemy that's to come. This is a type of every enemy that is even in front of you. This is a type of as you walk footstep by footstep by footstep in through the land, how you will rule and reign over them and take control of the scenario. In verse 26 it said, And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees, and they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down off and 
cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid, and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain unto this day. Again, that's an interesting scenario that happened because they just ended up back in the cave. He could have just as easily showed his dominion over them by rolling stones over it and leaving them there to die and rot. And yet this play, this production, this, this show openly was done. It was done for a specific purpose, that there would be no fear, nor dismay, nor lack of strength, nor lack of courage among the people of Israel. Because as these kings are, so shall all of your enemies be. He brings the kings out. They put their feet on them, showing the dominion. They slay them, cast them back into that. It's all a show and a picture and a type of the same thing that we're going to see in the end times. Dominion is shown by where you place your feet. And the angel back there in Revelation chapter 10 shows that he has dominion at that time as he comes down in the name of the Lord by placing his feet where he has dominion. It's a show of it openly. And so when he does so, he does it and he's not unarmed. <laughs> he's armed here with a little book which is <clears throat> open. Okay, And we discussed this kind of as, as, an, as, a, as a foretelling way back in Revelation chapter 5. And if you were, you can go to Revelation chapter 5. And right in the beginning verse, it says, And I saw, Revelation 5 verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And it continues and says, He saw a strong angel and he proclaims, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And then we know how it plays out. They continue to look at all of heaven and all of earth and no man is able to open that thing until... Jesus steps in. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I just said, hey, I think that that might be what we find in Revelation chapter 10. Because by the time you get to Revelation chapter 10 and verse 2, it says, there is in his hand a little book and now it is open. And back in chapter 5, there was a little book and it was sealed with seven seals. So what happened between 5 and chapter 10? Well, you find in verse or chapter 6, the beginning of the opening of the seals. He opened one of the seals, and there was the noise in the four beasts that say, come and see. The second, there's a noise, and the beast says, come and see. The third, and they say, come and see, and come and see, and come and see. And up into the seventh seal, which once it's opened, causes that seven trumpets are going to be sounded. Now you get to the point where these trumpets blast following sequentially as that seventh seal happens and then the first angel, the second angel, the third angel, the fourth angel, which we know and recorded these events to be as um, events of the wrath of God being poured out. We know that each one of these events built up to the point where now we're here in chapter 10 and we're, and we're beholding now that book is fully open. That book that was sealed is now fully open and it's ready to perform what it was intended to. So now he's got dominion over the earth. He's got dominion over the sea. He's got the token of the covenant upon his forehead. He has the open book in his hand. And what happens next? Look at verse 3. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And so he cries out. He makes this great proclamation. That loud voice is when a lion roars. Just a, just a, just a battle cry, perhaps. Just a roaring of that, that lion, as it were, voice coming out. And when it happens, seven thunders uttered their voices. And this is interesting what happens very next. Verse 4, it says, And when these seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write... And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And so my natural tendency is to be like, What are these seven thunders? What is the voice that sounded out? Can I look through the scriptures and can I find what was proclaimed, what was shouted out, what that voice said that John couldn't pen, but that maybe I could find here in the scriptures? Well, I've heard people have said it's, it's this or it's that or I think it's this and they found in the scriptures seven utterances of the same thing. And each one of them, though, comes with, a, 
comes with a, a doctrine behind it. And this is the problem. If, 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 if there's something in there and it's unclear, and you say, well, this is mentioned seven times in scriptures, and so this is what's uttered, and then you build a whole doctrine upon it, you're, you're, in, you're in the danger zone now when it comes to prophecy. We're in the book of Revelation. We're in the book that reveals truths. Daniel was a book that was sealed. Daniel was a book that was difficult to understand. That even Daniel wasn't given the full revelation of the things to come. He only penned it, proclaimed it, preached it, and then had it sealed for us until such a time as this. Revelation is supposed to be a book that gives us the truth, that reveals Jesus Christ, that reveals his plans for all people at the end days. And yet we find in there something that is sealed, that wasn't written, that was uttered. And then it's like, oh no, what do we do? Is this worrisome for us? I think it would be if it wasn't for the fact that in the timeline of events here, we're not present. We've been raptured. We're sitting up in heaven. And so when these things are uttered, when these seven thunders utter, we're going to be there. and We're going to hear it loud and clear. And I think it's going to be pretty obvious what's happening and what's being uttered at that time. And so, so it's not troublesome to us. It's, it's something that's going to be proclaimed. We'll already be in heaven. We will know even as we are known. We will have, we will have understanding of these things as they play out. So this isn't troubling. But what it does show to me is, is an indication that when things are going on on earth, there is going to be, what the Bible says, a famine for the hearing of the words of God. There's going to be things for people that stand on this earth um, when we're raptured up that are going to be missing from their full picture. God says, for this cause gave I them strong delusion that they should believe and not believe a lie that they might all be damned to receive not the love of the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I might have misquoted that, of course. But what you have here is an indication that while John was penning a revealing book that gives great truths and understanding, that God at this time is holding them some things back. Some level of understanding is going to be missing from the, these people. And that's a frightening thing, but it's also not something that we should, ex we should not expect. Why? Because just one chapter before, these people were not repenting of worshiping devils. They were not repenting of their idols, their murders, their sorceries, their fornication. They were bent to backsliding. They were bent to ruin. They were bent to being destroyed. They, they wanted nothing to do with the God of heaven. And so when he cries out in mercy and says something from heaven, would it shock us that it's, it's not revealed to them? Would it shock us that they wouldn't have access to that? I don't think so. It doesn't... It doesn't con Concern me, but it's amazing to find how many people are out there that have a wrong gospel, that preach a wrong message, that are a lying false prophet, that they're going to base their whole ministry upon trying to find out what the seven thunders are uttering. And isn't it amazing how they'll have this theory and that theory, this doctrine built upon it and that doctrine upon it, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth are these, and yet it's the main focus and the main thrust. And there's another reason, another way that we see prophecy being fulfilled is that something was uttered it's not contained in scriptures and men are at a loss to try to find out what it says you have Moses you have the prophets if they don't believe them neither will they believe if one should rise from the dead right the Bible promises great misunderstanding of the scriptures if people won't just at face value believe the scriptures everybody wants the extra book of Thomas. Everybody wants the secret book of Enoch. Everybody wants to know what these seven thunders are uttering, and yet 1,189 chapters are here and plain and free in the country that we live in to behold and to read. We want nothing to do with that. We're not going to follow the Word of God. We're not going to believe the truths and revelation that God gave us. No, give us some special thing, some hidden thing, some secret thing, some revelation like what are those seven thunders and what sounded from their voice? It's just a testimony of men and how they are and who they are as people. We're never satisfied. God gave us more book than we could ever read, and yet we want to know something deeper and secret and, and, and something that nobody else knows. Ha ha, and then I have this corner of the truth that nobody else does. No, I'm comforted by this because this is just another verification that God is in control. Hey, we'll be in heaven. We'll hear what those thunders utter. We'll all go, oh, cool, wow, wonderful, praise God. And we'll, we'll be able to have these things happening to us in real time. And we'll understand fully why he sealed those things up unto the apostle at this time. 
What's happening is what's recorded. And you don't have to turn there, but I'll just read it. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 20, it says, Come, my people, enter into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And so God invited us up to just spend a little time, to just enjoy a bit of our chambers, to have fellowship with him within his inner mansion, within the space that he has provided and made for each and every one of us. We can shut that door. We can rest in these things and we can just wait for the indignation to be overpassed. These things are not something that is going to be necessarily, I don't believe, easy for us to see or for to, to behold, but we'll have a full understanding. And so God invites us through the pages of the Old Testament to just come and enjoy. Wait for the indignation to be passed. Wait for the, the finality of all things. Behold what is happening, and yet don't be confounded by it. Don't be concerned with it, but just let these things be. Verse 5, it says, back in Revelation 10, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. And so he stands where he stands in dominion with the book in his hand, with the words of God in his hand. The seven thunders utter their voices, and he proclaims on the heels of that, swearing by the Lord, which liveth forever and ever, swearing by God Almighty that created all things, that there should be time no longer. And we all want to know what that moment is, don't we? Everyone's seeking after, you know, to date that. When, when there is time no longer, when there is out of time. I've heard it said that, that time ceases to exist there, and I know, in theories like that. I, I, that's just an Eng, old English way of just saying, hey, time is up. It, it's, it's, it's over. We're, we're, we've reached the final play. We, we've reached the end of all things. There is time no longer. Of course there's events that happen after that are going to be still transpiring within the context of a 24-hour day as the sun rises and the sun sets. Though there will be darkened at this point. But time no longer is simply the angel proclaiming, hey, hey, it's over now. It's over. The indignation is about to take place. Believers rest for a moment until it be over and past. And people on this earth get ready. Because the second woe is winding out, and there's a third that cometh quickly. And so there is no more time left. That day is come, is what he is announcing. Verse 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And so, again, we want to grab a hold of that mystery of what's been uttered as a thunder from heaven, and yet... God brings it back to the point, and his angel stands up and shouts by swearing by him that liveth forever and ever, that there is no time left, that it's over. And he says, the mystery of God is about to reveal as it was revealed unto the prophets. Not in some strange utterance, not in an audible voice, but in the law and in the prophets. That day is coming. So this mystery, and a mystery is simply something that is difficult to understand or difficult to explain, is coming to a head. It's coming to the end. And remember that now that we're in Revelation, what happened in the past would have been of great mystery unto us. But it's getting clearer. It's getting more concise. It's getting more understandable. And that's what I believe the book of Revelation does. I believe that if you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then you start into the prophets, you will get glimpses of what's happening in Revelation, but it will be a mystery. Some of these things will be hard to understand. You know what God likes to do when someone like Isaiah or Jeremiah is standing up preaching? Is he will say, the day of the Lord is at hand. And he's talking about the destruction of Babylon thousands of years ago. And yet, that same prophecy that was for them right then carries through time and has implications by application to the time where we're standing at now and looking at in Revelation. 
And so these prophecies often have a dual fulfillment or a partial fulfillment and a complete fulfillment. They're mysterious. They're hard to understand. They're hard to explain. And that's why as Bible-believing Christians in the New Testament, our greatest asset to understanding prophecy is the book of Revelation because it's revealing everything that had happened before, just as he promises here. He says, The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. And so while we hear from the prophets things like that day and the great day and the day of the Lord, too often it applied directly to the context of the people that were living in Isaiah's time, in Jeremiah's time, in Ezekiel's time. But God also transcends time and brings these to the current context that we're dealing with, and that's that the mystery of God is being fulfilled, is being finalized, when there's time no longer, where we're reading here now in Revelation chapter 10. If you were to go to Amos, and this is an interesting little passage, Amos chapter 3. And so you'll have uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, those are the bigger ones, Joel, and then Amos. <clears throat> And whenever we're reading the prophets, we need to, I believe the best way to do it is the same way you read any scriptures. So take what Amos is saying as an application directly to the men that he's preaching to. Sometimes you'll have to go and dig through uh, the Kings, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles to try to put them into the context they're dealing with right there but always you want to read the prophets as they were preaching directly to the people that were in front of them okay sometimes we take all of these and we try to make everything that Hosea said everything that Amos said everything that Isaiah said and put it way down through history 2,500 years later to the end times no these were real preachers preaching to the men that were they were looking at the whites of their eyeballs and they were proclaiming truths that were relevant to them then and applicable to them then. Yet he says something like this. It's interesting. Amos chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, Hear the word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel. Okay, right? So there, he's spoken against the children of Israel. Against his own people at this time. Against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Can a bird fall into a snare upon the earth where no gin is set or where no gin is for him? Can one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Surely, look at this verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? What's, what's Amos saying here? He's saying that... that <clears throat> All of these events have a cause. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar if he have no prey? Can a bird fall into a snare if it was never laid in the first place? Is a trumpet going to sound and no one's going to hear the voice? Even so, it says in verse 7, that God is not going to do anything except he reveals his secrets unto his servants and prophets. That verse is revealing that the important aspects of what's going on within the scheme of God's plan for his people are revealed unto his servants, the prophets. The lion roared, who will not fear. The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy. And so I've often taken this verse and applied it directly to the people of Israel that Amos was speaking to in the context that he was living in, but also taken it by extension to know that if the Lord is going to do something, he will reveal it unto his servants, the prophets. If the Lord has anything at all to do, his servants are going to know about it. And so there is going to be no secret kept from us that was needful. So therefore, when we hear something like we did back in the context, like a trumpet sounding with no written word to proclaim what it was, we don't need to worry because surely the Lord will do nothing except he revealed it unto his servant, the prophets. It's not something that we need to fret about, we need to worry about, we need to be concerned about. Going back to Revelation chapter 10, 
You'll often hear again the prophet saying, that day, the great day, the day of the Lord. And here it is coming to fruition. The servants, his prophets are declaring it, as they did back then, now to our immediate context. And it's coming full circle. So it's revealed first as a mystery, but now as something that we can comprehend and we can understand if it's needful for us to do so. So as we saw in verse 7, it says, There is something that is finished as he hath declared it. What is finished? The mystery of God. The um, hard and difficult things to understand. They're coming to an end here. And so we see often, we see here, we're halfway through Revelation, right? And there is a finality happening. Okay? The angel came down, he's standing there with a the little book that was sealed, now is open. The whole, the whole woe and worry was that this book would never be open, and now here it is, open in his hand. He's got the, the token of the covenant that was promised way back, is now sitting here 2,000 years after Christ, on his head, prepared, he's prepared for a time, he's got dominion over things, he cries out and says, there should be time no longer, there is a finality of things, something is about to end, we're out of time here, and when he does, he talks about a seventh angel that is about to sound, and when he does, the mystery of God should be finished as was declared. So there's something that has been going on since the time of the prophets, and even before that, we see two or three examples of events that are now finalizing. Things are winding down. There is time no longer. Something is about to change. Something is about to end. And in verse 8, it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, saying, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And so... John was in heaven. They couldn't open the book. The book got opened. The angel came down, showed his dominion, is holding the book. And God says, go and take that little book from his hand. And I, I love this because when you read into verse 9, the first part of that, you find great boldness in John. He says, and I went to the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. <laughs> I, I, you, you saw John before here, you know just in great fear and awe, falling at his feet before the Lord. You, you, you found him, him in terrors and, and worries and, and concerns with things that are going on. I just love the great boldness that he has to go before this angel and just walk up and say, give me the little book. And he passes it over to him as it, as it says. Now, the interesting thing is, is why? Is John being so bold here? Well, it's because he is now following in the direction of the voice above. He's not, he's not standing before fearsome angels. He's not standing before um, uh, the, these angelic beasts that were surrounding the throne, seeing the thunder and lightning, beholding God in, in all his glory. Now he's back, I believe, on earth. He's, he's, he's seeing the angel that has the book, and he just walks up to him and says, give me that little book. And he does so. He says, give me that little book. And he said unto him, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. And this isn't the first time that an example like this has taken place. We've seen that before where a prophet has taken a little book, eaten it, and made his belly bit bitter. Go to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel was another prophet that saw great heavenly and terrible and awful visions, even, even in the beginning of his ministry, where he's seeing these living creatures, wheels within wheels, all sorts of strange and frightening visages. These things had, had different heads, and, and uh, he saw this great, glorious appearance, and then began his ministry, and then began to take part in the things that God had for him. In Ezekiel chapter 3, again, very early in his ministry, it says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee into the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of strange speech, of an hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent, I thee, sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. 
But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are imputed and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy faith strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears. And go and get thee to them of the captivity, and unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. And so this is a type of what's happening with the book, with the end of the book of Revelation, where Ezekiel is given the ministry to eat a roll and to go speak exactly what God says. And when he goes and he speaks exactly what God says, at that time it was to the children of Israel. It was to God's people that should have been attentive to hear. God says whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, give a glimmer of hope that they would hear, that they would uh, regard the words of God and they would be corrected by the words of God and they would repent and get right before God. He said, I'm not sending you to many nations. I'm not sending you to many tongues. And yet that's the exact opposite of what we have in Revelation. The apostle in Revelation, he says, and take the little book out of the angel's hand, and he ate it up, and it was in his mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as he has eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kindreds. And the, and the preaching of the word of God wasn't something that was comforting. So often with the scriptures, I'll take in a, 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 a portion of scriptures, and it will be in my mouth as sweet as honey. As the Bible describes, the psalmist said, thy word is as sweet as honey. And that's, that's how it's often described as you take the word, your eyes are enlightened. We saw back in the book of Kings when, uh, when um, Jonathan took of the honey, and his eyes were enlightened. It's like the word of God does to us. You take of it, and here he takes it out of the angel's hand, and it's as sweet as honey. It's, it's, it's wonderful to the taste, but it immediately makes his belly bitter. Why? Because I believe he took of the word of God, and he realized that though it was sweet to him as a believer, though it was sweet to him as the saved individual, it was, it was judgment and ruin and condemnation to those that were going to hear it. This wasn't a group that was going to hear or forbear. This was a group that had, had turned away their ears from hearing the miracles of God as he sent his judgments upon the earth. They turned away their ears from hearing the words of God as the witnesses came and proclaimed the preaching. Even angels flying through the skies and proclaiming the everlasting gospel was it something that was going to change this group. And so when John stands before the angel, receives the book, eats it up, he's like, the word of God is so sweet to me. How sweet it is to my bones. How sweet it is to my taste and yet it's bitter to my belly because when I preach it those that hear will be condemned they will refuse it they will reject it it will be as refuse and waste unto them they won't hear they won't forbear nothing will change what these have set in their hearts to do even as it was in Babylon nothing could change the fact that all men had united under one banner as an affront to God in order to climb a tower that reached unto heaven, a tower that was of their own works, of their own will, of their own deeds, of their own doing. And so he hears the word of God, he eats the word of God, and now his command is clear that before many peoples, before many nations, before many tongues, and before many kindreds and kings of this earth, he must prophesy. He must proclaim that sweet word of God that is bitter to the stomach, that hurts to deliver, but he must do it faithfully. It's sweet to the mouth. It's bitter to the belly. You know what it is? It's something that's tough to swallow. It's a hard to swallow pill, right? Sometimes you hear the word of God and, and you know that it's sweet and you know that it's good, but you know that you're guilty. And so when you take it in, it, it's tough. It's hard to swallow. That's a hard to swallow pill. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not, right? But you know it's sweet. You know it's good for you. You know it's right unto you. And the same was true for the revelator here. He has the word of God given to him. He takes that little book and he eats it. He's got to deliver a tough to swallow message, but he's got to do it faithfully. Thou must prophesy. Now notice, it's interesting because it doesn't say, like so often it did in the scriptures, to all nations, all kindreds, all tongues. Those are already in heaven, aren't they? 
But now there are many peoples left. There are many nations left. There are many tongues left. There are many kings left who have to hear a tough-to-swallow sermon, a tough-to-swallow message. And you know what it is? It's the same message they've always been hearing. And this is why people are without excuse. As it said in Romans 1, When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. That message has been ringing out throughout eons, throughout ages. The mystery of God that was declared by His servants, the prophets, has not changed since the beginning. In the beginning, God created God created. So why are we standing here 6,000 years later worshiping the creature more than the creator? He is blessed forever. Amen. This is the problem that mankind continually suffers with. And it's of their own doings. God created a creation that he wanted to have fellowship with. And his creation said, nuts to you. I want nothing to do with you. I want nothing to do with your word. What you have to say, God, I hate your rules. I hate your ways. I hate yourself. I hate you, God, is what men are constantly saying to him. And so he leans down and he proclaims the message. He leans down and he gives them the truth. And he reveals unto them. It was mysterious in the past. It was hard to understand in the past. But that's why God sent preachers to explain and to expound and to give them the the understanding and give them the clarity. And they've been doing it for times and times and times and times and times and men still reject it. And so God even got things simpler unto the end of time. Revelation is the clearest of all prophetic books and it explains with simple understanding Understanding in the grand scheme of things what is happening. God wants you to repent. God wants you to be in his kingdom. God wants you to turn from your evil ways to trust him and to know that his word is true and yet men continue to refuse it. It's the, it's the tale as old as time. God reaches unto man with an outstretched arm and men continue to reject and to refuse it. Even to the end that he takes the mystery of his preaching as was delivered by his servants, the prophets, and he finishes it with complete clarity. Nobody is going to stand at the end of all this and be like, I had no idea that God was returning in the clouds to judge the world. I had no idea that there was a holy creator that wanted nothing more than to fellowship with. I had no idea that God sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is finished. The conclusion of the matter is the same as it was written in Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. And yet men continue to reject and continue to refuse it. And so do you know what's going to happen more and more and more? Is we're going to all end up like John. We're going to end up like John taking a sweet book into our mouth and proclaiming it with a bitter stomach to those that don't want to hear it. We're going to take the sweet, sweet words of life. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let them more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. We'll go to proclaim them to people. Those sweet, loving, kind, compassionate words. And the audience will reject them so it's bitter in our stomach as they hate God, hate his words, hate his truths, hate him. And yet we have to go. And as John was said, hey, before many, you must prophesy. Peoples, nations, kindreds, tongues, kings. You've got to get that word out there. But it's with a bitter stomach. That will do so. More and more and more and more. Here we are at the end of it all. And it's the same old story, only there's time no longer. It's the end. It's the last straw. It's the final curtain is about to drop upon all mankind. Here it is in Revelation chapter 10. God's beginning to finish the mystery. He says in verse 7, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. You're going to look over in chapter 11 and in verse 15, and it says, And the seventh angel sounded. What happens when that seventh angel sounded? And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. There is time no longer by the time we get here. It's it. It's finished. Case closed. God's done with these people, and yet we don't see any lack of him trying to reach them. We see him sending a prophet that has a, such a bitter belly at the sweet words that have went into his mouth that it's hard for him to proclaim the truth, and yet he does so faithfully. God still is in the business of saving people into the bitter end. He's just poured out 
two-thirds of his wrath upon all mankind to just beg them to believe, beg them to change, and yet they would not. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. Wrath on these, no mercy for them. And so, thank God.